the honor is mine to be here uh, by invitation of the, the group, our sister group in the philosophy department. And the talk will be about breaking the proof code. Okay, so uh, you probably get some reference uh, to Turing. And the talk will make a lot of references and connections to computer science. So I hope there will be some philosophical element in it. Okay. Um, probably should click here. Yes. Okay, so this is a very good question for one to make oneself when uh, we start doing proofs. How many of them are correct? Uh, many of them that I do are not. And I hope you're also human like me and make mistakes. So some proofs are not correct and need to be corrected. The question is, how does this compare to something in green that you cannot read, which is software developing? Because in software developing also you have the problem of having bugs. And there is some evidence actually that in typing code, programmers usually introduce a lot of mistakes. 1.5 mistake per line is a lot. Obviously, some of them are just typos and they go back and correct. Some of them very, are very, very dangerous and can compromise the program. But actually, a lot of bugs go to the market. A lot of the bugs will never be found and will go and we will find them as users later on. And then the software engineers call them features and they're over. No longer bugs. Okay, um, what about in math? Well, in math, also a lot of papers contain mistakes. And if you had read any paper with attention, you probably have found some. It might be a small mistake, but it's very common to find some mistakes. Some of them are not too serious, but some of them just make you throw it away, throw the paper away. Well, the first two uh, things I mentioned here actually uh, are evidence that it's mentioned, these evidences, uh, it's mentioned in the paper by Tom Hales in the AMS notices in 2008. The last one uh, is just collected from a blog, so you, you might not, uh, you do, need, do not need to believe what I write here, one in three papers, that there is no real calculation done about this. But in practice, we find a lot of mistakes in papers. Well, someone might claim that this is not a big issue because most mathematical papers are actually useless. Nobody's going to read them besides the author and the referee, or maybe not even the referee, or, the, or uh, in some cases, not even the author. Uh, but this guy who is a winner of the Euler medal, which is a medal which was gone to him as a champion of, a champion of using computers and algorithms to do mathematics quickly and efficiently claim that actually we have to be able to, to find out which are the things which are worth uh, paying attention to. And interestingly, uh, there are some curious that I'm going to throw in the lecture. This guy uh, has a computer co-author since the 1980s. It's called, uh, there is something to write, it's called 3B1. 3B1 is the name of his computer. And he just mentions, mentions the co-author as Shalosh be Echad, which is the same in Hebrew. So most of his papers has, have some co-author mentioned at the end with the name Shalosh be Echad, which is just his computer that he used in finding, in, in finding his, or checking his proofs. Okay, so let's try to compare proof writing to software development. You can't see, it's the green thing over there. Okay, so... Um, if we do the comparison, perhaps we just get the worst of both worlds. We have the idea that mathematics has bugs, but also when we start doing things, trusting more on tests than in real proofs, which is on experimental mathematics, which try trying things without proving, maybe we even get worse than we were before. So how much does this give us of the best? Well. Numerical experiments in mathematics have been a tool for mathematical exploration for decades, even when computers were not in our, in our tables. So they can be very useful, for instance, in trying to um, create intuition about some topic. Or 
like in physics, to use them as bubble chambers to see some uh, subparticle going through and say, well, there must be something there. These analogies are by um, a, a mathematician and physicist called Mitchell Feigenbaum, who was very influential for me. He was is one of the developers of nonlinear dynamics and the chaos uh, theory, which was the topic of my first uh, scientific fellowship, uh, Iniciação Científica. Uh, so he championed the use of computers for creating intuition, and he used the computers as uh, these kind of experimental machines in which he could find out statements of theorems to prove outside the computer later on. I myself have done this in my master's thesis when I, I found out two theorems by chance looking for them. But I found statements that I wanted to prove and then I, I actually used the computer to try and find half of the proof and then I finished it outside the computer. Today I'm going to talk about the possibility of doing this whole thing inside the computer, using the computer from the beginning to the end. Is it possible at all? Well, let me just comment first on three things that we uh, look for and which are highly criticized when we uh, talk about proofs made on the computer. So when, when we try to structure proofs, like we, we try to structure programs in the computer, like putting indentation and trying to make this in a way that we can follow more easily the uh, inner behavior, behavior of, the, of the program. Well, one of the things we might ask ourselves is whether we have the right amount of precision, because if we have too much, more than what we need, it might be distracting. Uh, this is a comment by Nicolas Bourbaki, it's a famous non-existent mathematician from the 1960s, who wrote a lot of books, even though he didn't exist. Uh, and re-deed, re, um, gave a, a new foundation to mathematics starting from the bottom and doing everything in a lot of detail. He, he said, well, even the tiniest proof would be reduced to something which would be pretty useless at the end. And if you look at his definition of number one in all details, this uh, mathematician, this set theorist, uh, calculated that this definition, if it would be expanded, would have more than four trillion symbols. So imagine, I'm talking about one, but I'm talking about four trillion symbols. That's a lot of gigabytes, right? Or terabytes. Um, so he said, formalized mathematics is useless, we should quickly abandon it. Now, another question we might ask ourselves is whether we have the right amount of rigor because usually we think of mathematicians as, as trying to do proofs which are watertight. Well, this is a proof that I took from a book um, by Bertrand Russell and, and, and Alfred Whitehead. It's a proof of uh, 1 plus 1 equals 2. They say here at the end, from this proposition it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined, it has not been defined yet in the book, that 1 plus 1 equals 2. And this is page 379 of the, the, the volume, the first volume, and they only define everything that they actually need to finish this in the second volume. So it's a lot of work also to uh, try to define 1 plus 1 equals 2. But it's very rigorous, if you think of it. Do we, we, do we want to do it? Well, actually, I never had the patience myself to read this book. So... It might not be something that we want to do it ourselves as humans. But these two humans did it at the beginning of the 20th century. Now, and the last thing that uh, mathematicians always look for when writing a proof is for beauty. Because they think of mathematics as a form of art. And do we have beauty? Well, I like this quote by Jacobi, the one that you know from Calculus, saying that, well, the Richelieu is the only one that actually can be trusted when doing mathematics. If Cauchy or Gauss claim to have done a complete rigorous mathematical proof, there might be some mistake. But de Richelieu, when he does it, this is like a declaration of love, right? It's beautiful. He's saying this guy is the only one that can do mathematics correct. He's the only one that does it beautifully and correct. Well, this is, a, this is from a paper by Leslie Lamport. You might know the LA of Lamport from LaTeX. He's the guy that created that. And he um, countenanced some criticisms to uh, formal proofs or structured proofs and said, well, people usually say that they're just too complicated, as I said myself a few minutes ago, that they are not really explaining what's going on. 
and they are not really pieces of great literature, they're not beautiful. But we should contrast this to a problem that he finds and he shows in one of his papers, in, in this paper actually that I mentioned, um, in which he just tried to pick up a beautiful proof from a beautiful book on topology by Kelly on a very well-known fact called the schroeder bernstein theorem. And there is a problem in the proof. And he only finds out the problem and the mistake in the proof when we try to write it in a structured way, just like when we pass from a piece of software that's written in a messy way to a piece of software that's written in a beautifully structured way that anyone can parse through and can get into it as deep as we want. So he, he, can he claimed and, and showed that he, we can find mistakes if we just start structuring proofs. But this is a very important problem, and this is a very important philosophical problem, is whether, what are proofs? And should proofs be human surveyable? Should, they, should we be able as humans to go through the proofs, and these proofs that are very long probably give us a hint that we cannot do it? Should they or should they not? I'm not going to go into, too far into this, I'm going to discuss some, some aspects related uh, to, to surveyability, but not surveyability itself. And I'm going to uh, say why. I'm not really so much worried about surveyability, about being able to see and understand the whole proof at once. But I'll just give you two examples, which are already in the literature and which do not use computers in their proofs. There is, for instance, this uh, important big paper by Omgren, which was written by hand and has 1,728 pages. He was for more than 10 years writing this paper. And uh, it has not used computers. So it was a human producing something which is not human surveyable. Uh, not for most humans. And this is another example. When Gorenstein uh, announced that the classification of finite simple groups, this so-called monster theorem, was finished in 1983, they found a small gap. But this small gap to be filled needed to or demanded a paper of 1,221 pages to be written. It was just a tiny, small gap that was in there. Again, hard to say that this is human surveyable. Is it correct? <laughs> well, I would need to understand the whole thing to uh, start judging it. Anyway, um, one question you might ask ourselves is whether are these theoreticians, these mathematicians, are they in needs of techniques uh, developed by proof uh, kind of software engineering of proof, like proof engineering. Well, let me just say, there are a lot of techniques, which starting from the use of the right data structures, the right uh, storage, the right way of referencing the material, the, using it in a database, consulting it, that might help you in dealing with things when they get too large. And this is typical of uh, software engineering. So do we need proof engineering? Okay, so I start this new slide by quoting Turing, which is very appropriate here, I think, uh, as he was one of the initiators of computer science. This is a beautiful quote in which he says that actually intellectual activity consists mainly of various kinds of search. So actually, intellectual activity is search. We start implementing search uh, early in computer science, and he says that basically, Everything intelligent that you do is actually search. Why do I, does he say it? Because actually search for him is very large, involves intellectual, uh, genetical, cultural searches, everything he calls search. But if you think of mathematics, typically you can think of a problem in arithmetics as find a number n such that blah, blah, blah. So if you have to find a number, you're talking about searching for the number. And the answer would be, I cannot find this number, it doesn't exist, or I can't find a number, here it is. I can find one of these numbers and here it is. So Turing says also in the paper that we should not go, not go far wrong from the time being if we assumed that all problems are reduced to the search problem, find a number n such that. And at the end he says that intellectual search could be reduced to find a proof such that. Okay. So computer-assisted proof, let me discuss how it goes. I'll just call these kind of proofs any mathematical proof that has been at least partially generated by a computer, and I'm going to discuss several ways in which this generation can go through. So I have mentioned before the possibility of using the computer for doing some exploration of mathematical phenomena. And 
here I, I also mentioned the possibility of using it for s just searching for relevant information when you have a large database and you have to go through it, or to check and verify the correctness of proofs. Maybe computers can, do, can help us doing this, and actually they have been used for this for quite some time now. I'm going to discuss a little bit more of this. For assisting the production, so it's like your intelligent assistant to which you can ask questions whenever you need, and he will always be honest and answer whatever he knows about it. So a computer can do this endlessly as soon as we have, or as far as we have electrical engineering, and as we know how to program this computer. It doesn't get tired of it, right? Of being a slave to us. Uh, and here, uh, this production might also involve some clever search, like Turing mentioned. And the idea of discovering new theorems. Is it even possible to use a computer to discover a new theorem? And how would that go on? I mentioned uh, situations in which I have done it myself. How does it go? Well, let me mention some situations in which uh, this might happen. And just before, mention the risks which are involved. So I might be looking too optimistic about using the computer, so let me just mention the risks. First, if we're doing things informally, there are a lot of risks. One of the risks is that we can just forget one of the cases that we need to check. There are a lot of cases to check. Or we appeal to our intuition, but we don't have a good one. We have made definitions imprecise. We have left gaps in the reasoning. We have applied the facts that we know in a wrong way. There are a lot of ways we can go wrong. So now here is a question. I would like to know your opinion about this. Who do you think is more reliable to do all this stuff? Computers or humans? Who thinks computers are more reliable? Two people? Three? Humans? Oh, there's some two people that like humans here. And there are a lot of agnostic people. OK, so Don McKenzie, in a very beautiful book on the sociology of proof, he uh, discusses the risks and the trust that we put on things which are done by the computer, or which are checked by the computer, and that might involve life risk death risk, risk to life. I tend to think that computers are more reliable just because they don't get tired and they follow the instructions as we told them to. And if there is a mistake in following our instructions, it's my mistake, not theirs. But you might have different opinions about this. The thing is that we can also check what the computer is doing and try to make it more and more reliable, while humans will never be reliable. Trust me on this. Okay. Uh, let me just mention then some situations in which the computers have been used in calculation, so calculemus. I'm going to mention some uh, of these five situations in which computers might be useful in doing exhaustive checking, which is the most well-known use of computer. It's just using it to do a lot of combinatorial tasks and in other tasks. For instance, in combinatorial tasks, we can try to use the computer to analyze all the outcomes of a game. You have, for instance, Connect Four, this game that you have to put things, four things in a row. It has been analyzed, and recently uh, they have discovered that Connect Four, if you work with optimal strategies, is a game to be won by the first player. So now you're not going to play it as a second player any longer, right? So we have proved that the first player can always win. Uh, another thing which uh, has been, a lot of effort has been involved is in Rubik, Rubik's Cube, this cube in which you have to put things in order. So since the beginning of the 80s, people try to, try to find the least number of movements to be able to solve any configuration of the cube. So in the beginning of the 80s, they started with 82. That was the number. Quickly, they descended to 52. And in 2010, finally, it was proved using a lot of computation that God's number is 20. God's number is the number of movements that you need to solve Rubik's Cube. <laughs> so there is a web page on this God's number. You can check. I'm going to talk about the four color theorem, so I'm not going to explain it uh, right now. And I'm going to talk about all these other problems uh, related to generation of models, generation of proofs, 
generation of, of or just checking, uh, uh, f making a formal verification of uh, important mathematical theorem. And I'm going to talk a little bit about decidability at the end. So these uh, red things are the things I'm going to concentrate. They're real mathematical problems. They're not just um, a game that we're, that we're playing, but things which have, in some cases, been open for hundreds of years. And how did the computers, how were the computers useful in tackling this kind of problems? Okay, so I start just with a, a warning that, as I said, when I'm talking about correctness of something, and I'm checking formal correctness, these should be thought as modulus some axiomatic framework, so modulus some theory, if you know what I'm talking about. So it only makes sense to ask about this, not in an absolute way, but it, from the point of view of a theory, which might be the theory of proofs, might be set theory, might be anything you want to call a theory in mathematics. Now, this is one thing which is just for uh, provoking the uh, professors around. Uh, whether in the future there will be a new role for referees of papers, because nowadays referees have a lot of work trying to read the whole paper and trying to find out mistakes and so on. Maybe in the future, if we start to formalize more and more the proofs, the task of the referee will not be running the proof because it's now a program, but something quite close to it. It might be exercising his professional judgment on the possibility of converting this proof into a formal proof and then checking whether it's correct after this conversion has been done. If we have a lot of patience, maybe we do the conversion itself and we can release this as a piece of code that might be run and might be checked. But maybe in the future, more and more attention will be paid to the importance of making the paper written in a way that it's closer and looks more similar to formalized mathematics than it does nowadays in sometimes what we call the Victorian way of doing mathematics. Okay, so let me tackle the first real problem, four color theorem. How many of you have heard about the four color theorem? Very few. Okay, when I was in high school, this, everybody discussed about this. So it was a hot topic. But maybe nowadays it's not any longer. The four color theorem, as everybody knows or should know, is the problem of coloring Paraguay in such a way that it doesn't have the same color of Argentina or Bolivia or Brazil. So actually it wasn't like this. It was like the problem of coloring Luxembourg. But anyway, we were more interested in coloring Latin America. It was the idea that any planar map could be colored by using at most four different colors in such a way that two contiguous countries never have the same color. Now, an interesting thing about this problem, planar problem, is that I can write it down here. I can, it's flat, right? So I can just think of this as a map, as complicated as I might think. And the problem is whether this map here could be colored using only four colors without adjacent uh, countries having the same color. So one way, interesting way of looking at this problem is instead of thinking about a map, it's transforming this into a graph. So think about this, each country as just node and say that they are contiguous when there is a way of going from one node to the other. So there is one way here, one way here, 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 and here. Now, erase in your minds the map that I have done here before. We have a problem about graphs. So the problem is about the nodes, adjacent nodes in a graph having the same color. How many colors do we need? Well, let me just mention you a, a, a few things. In, the, in 1852, the problem was raised uh, in a puzzle. I did just mention this puzzle. It was actually raised by, by um, this guy called uh, Francis Guthrie. His brother was a student of Augustus de Morgan. And he told the, his brother to take, the, 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 to take this puzzle to De Morgan to solve. And De Morgan had to confess that he wasn't able to solve it in 1852. But actually, it was only solved very recently. But it's, it's such an interesting problem that could be solved easily, could be taken by your brother to school, and you could uh, make your professor look odd 
uh, and ridiculous but not being able to solve such a simple problem. Okay, so in the end of the, it's still the 19th century, there was a very influential wrong proof that was published by Alfred Kempen. Actually, it was in the literature for 11 years before people found out that it was wrong. But it's an interesting way of being wrong. He failed in a very interesting way. He failed in such a way that the method used in his false proof was used in the correct proof 100 years later. So the method was important, even though he was wrong. The method was to do an induction on what we call a reduction of these configurations. So trying to make a graph a smaller graph. And in 1976, actually, uh, Kenneth Apple and Wolfgang uh, Hacken were the first ones to prove this, and they used a computer to do it. It was one of the most important proofs known to be done using a computer, and it was only in the 70s. And the strategy of the proof is quite simple. It's a proof by absurd, and they do an induction on top of it. So what they do is that they show that all possible configurations that we might ever imagine of maps could be reduced to just 1,936 configurations, which are minimal in the sense there is nothing smaller than them. And then, case by case, using the computer, they show that all these minimal maps can be reduced to smaller maps. But that couldn't be done if they're minimal. So they find an absurd, they find a contradiction in 1,936 different cases. So it's a very simple structure, but it's a pain to check. It's just too many cases. That's why they use a computer, just to do this exhaustive checking, check all the cases. Well, so they had part of the proof done with a computer, which was this reduction, and part of it was a mathematical strategy, which was done on paper. Now, uh, in 1996, these almost 2,000 reductions were cut into 633 configurations, so it's a big victory. Now you can all do it yourselves, right? All the cases. Well, still, we would use a computer, it's just too many cases to do, but using mathematics you can reduce the number of cases, so using your intelligence you can reduce the number of cases. And here is the important part. Here enters Georges Gontier. He uh, proposed, and he proposed this to Microsoft in France, that he would be able to write the whole proof, not just the exhaustive part of it, the whole proof inside of a computer and check the whole proof using the computer. So it was, he proposed to do a fully formalized program proof. What does he call a, a, a formal program proof? It's a proof that describes what to do, so there is an algorithm there but also says why this should be done, in a sense that it explains and verifies at each step that what's being done is what should be done, in a sense, to attain your goal. So the, I like the way he puts it in, in terms of why, it's like the computer could understand what it's doing, but it, it can check. And in 2005, he finished compilation. Actually, he finished the proof, completely done in the computer, and he used a, a proof assistant called Coq, which some of you might have heard. It's built over a functional programming language, and what's interesting is that now it's a fully computerized proof, not just the exhaustive part, but also there is a computer assistant checking the rest. Now let me jump to another problem. Not just exhaustive checking plus some formalization, but something that we call model generation. Now, I hope you appreciate this because you know everything that I'm going to mention here. These high school identities are very well known to you. But I hope you also appreciate my effort in finding this picture of Alfred Tarski. It's very hard to find a picture of him looking serious. <laughs> very hard. Okay. Uh, so consider the following identities that you know from school. The first one saying, for instance, that addition is commutative. The second one, second one saying that it's associative. And then saying the same about uh, product. Then saying that one is the neutral element of product. Then saying that product distributes over addition. 
So we all have memorized this in school, we know how this works. We might call this the axioms, the equations of our theory, or the identities uh, um, behind our theory. Okay, so here, is a, 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 here are two interesting facts. First of all, if we think of all the things which are true, which we call the equational theory, all the things which are true about natural numbers with real addition, or natural addition, natural product, and the one that we all know, do these characterize all the things which are true that we can say about natural numbers in this signature using then addition, sum, and one? The answer is yes. We can characterize everything. Everything can be done just by looking at this uh, sequence of uh, identities. And there's also a decision procedure for this, uh, for this um, theory. There is a way of checking, if you give me a new identity I have never seen before, checking in, using an algorithm without thinking of it, checking that or checking whether this new identity is true or whether it's false. The idea is simple. You give me these two identities, uh, give me this, this identity with two terms, I reduce, reduce both terms to a certain normal form, so I apply these equalities over here in a certain sense to both sides, and then if at the end both of them reduce to the same polynomial, then I say that it's true that the two sides represent the same object. And this can be done for this particular language. Oh, let me add a little bit more language. In school we have not just studied addition and multiplication, but we also have studied exponentiation. And we have studied all these rules about exponentiation in its relation to, uh, to uh, addition or to multiplication. Now, these, these, uh, these identities can all be found in a paper by um, Dedekind in, from 1888 called uh, Was sind und was sollen die Zahlen? What they are and what they should be. What the numbers are and what they should be. Now, let me try just to give a computer science perspective on this. You might not like to think nowadays about this as a set of equations about numbers, but, but you might want to think of them recursively. For instance, you might want to think of a new uh, data type in which things might be a big circle, or the successor, or the addition, the multiplication, the exponentiation. But imagine I don't say anything about these symbols. I just say that, well, you see, addition is whatever is defined by these two recursive equations by recursion on the second component. And multiplication is whatever is defined by these two things, and exponentiation by these two identities. Now, it is possible using these identities over here, as some of you might know, to prove all these identities by induction. And some of them get harder and harder to prove. For instance, to prove this last one here, you probably have to use, or you actually have to use most of all the things that came before. So they get really nasty if, as, as you go through, but it's just exercise. Anyone can do this exercise of checking by induction over these recursive definitions that all this is true. But forget about induction for a moment. Let's go back just to this. Imagine that no one ever told us that you can implement these operations recursively. They just give us these axioms and ask us the same questions that were asked before. Do they characterize all the truths that you can write in a theory containing exponentiation besides the other things you had before? And do we have a decision procedure for this theory? Well, I'm going to ask you your intuition about this. I gave you the answer before. It was yes in both cases. Do you think the answer for this first question is to yes, that everything we learned in school is sufficient to prove everything we'll ever need to prove about these operations? Who thinks the answer is yes? Who doesn't think anything? Who thinks the answer is no? Okay, three people think the answer is no. Even though the answer was BS before, I just added exponentiation. Now, I said before that we could have a decision procedure associated to the idea of reducing both sides of the equality into a simpler polynomial and then checking if it's the same polynomial. Can we do the same for this theory? Who thinks the answer is yes? 
who thinks the answer is no. Okay, surprise, surprise. The answer for the first one is no and the second is yes. So even though there is something missing here, not everything is written here. So there is some truth about arithmetic which is not derivable from these equalities. There is a decision procedure for these equalities. Now, the, the proof of the second part is actually quite simple. The idea uh, was, had already been done by the, for the one variable case in the, in the 60s, 69, I think, and then McIntyre in 81 uh, proved for the general case. The idea, uh, if you know what I'm talking about, is that was using the fact that the variety of the induced by these equations over the natural numbers is the same as the variety over the positive, fra positive part of the real numbers, and then using analysis, using calculus to check and to give a procedure for this. Now, I'm going to discuss the negative answer. Let me give you a, if it's a negative answer, answer I need to give you a counterexample. I need to give you an equation which is true about the natural numbers, but which is not derivable from this. Here's an equation. It looks complicated, and only in the 80s somebody was able to think about it, and the, uh, it involves only plus, uh, addition, and multiplication, but these A, B, C, D are written down here as polynomials. So for instance, D is 1 plus x squared plus x to the 4. Okay? So this guy proposed that this identity is true, and this can be checked. You just have to know of a way of checking using this decision procedure we mentioned before, whether it is, uh, it, these two things reduce the same polynomial. And he, he proposed that this, this was not provable from all these things which are in here. Now, I'm, going to, I'm not going to discuss uh, very much how this proof is done, but the idea uh, behind it is quite simple, is that you show that um, you can rewrite this C in such a way and this D in such a way using this equation E. But notice that in this equation E, there is a negative sign. And I didn't mention subtraction, right? So, in a way, we, we might uh, claim that the problem about this equation, even though it's true, and the problem about it not being provable by, from the identities we had before, is the difficulty of manipulating polynomials with negative coefficients in that theory that doesn't have, uh, doesn't have a subtraction. But let me just give you a, a bit more detail on this. It, this is quite interesting, at least for one person in this, in this room. The first proof that this identity is not derivable from the previous identities is a proof using a proof theoretical argument. It's an induction on the length of all the proofs that you can produce using the previous uh, identities. So the guy proved that this equation will never appear. doesn't matter how long your proof goes. Now, usually mathematicians don't like this kind of proofs. Uh, some of them do, but usually they, they, they're not very happy with an argument manipulating proofs just because they're not prepared yet to think about proofs as a mathematical object, as they should, but they're not. So usually they ask about actual counterexamples. They say, well, okay, so I don't want just to, uh, to prove this by the impossibility of constructing a proof. I want to see actually some algebra that I can build in which all the previous identities are true, but this one is not. And this is what we call using models. And generating these models might, might be done by the computer. For instance, the first person that actually proposed a model for this proposed an algebra with 59 elements. So now you can imagine a Cayley table in which you have 59 elements and then 59 elements and you say one by one what's the product of these elements. And then you try to test all the equations we had before to say whether in this uh, interpretation of the, the product or the, the, the addition, uh, the previous equations are true. This is really a pain. This guy did this in 1985. And then people try to reduce. Maybe we don't need a counterexample that big. Maybe we need less elements. Actually, in 2001, um, there was a first proof uh, published about the sufficiency of 12 elements to give a counterexample by Stanley Burris and Yet. And 
very recently uh, in a computer science um, conference, a uh, Chinese uh, professor published a, a proof, or Chinese actually, I think it was a PhD student, he published the proof that you can't do this with less than 11 elements. So that's the state of knowledge nowadays. We know that we need at least 11 elements and we know that 12 is enough. So this means that we don't know if 11 is enough. Nobody has ever proved whether 11 is enough or not. And the reason why it's so hard to do these kind of things just by exhaustion, you might think of it. If you have an algebra with n elements and you start thinking about all the possibilities of tables that you can give, all interpretations you can give to these operators, this number grows very fast. For instance, if n equals 2, you have 4,096 different tables that you can write on. And only five of these are candidates. So actually you write a lot of useless stuff and you throw most of it away. And if you go uh, um, further and you put n equals 5, then the number is at the order of 10 to 52 tables which is something we cannot do by exhaustion, even nowadays, even with all the calculations we can do nowadays. So this needs uh, some intellectual effort at, at, at the end, at the other end. It, doesn't, it can't be solved just by brute force nowadays. And the techniques for proving things like this, at least in the, in the, in the, um, in the work of Gudevich and then Burris and Yetz, uses uh, very uh, advanced mathematics, uses some, one thing called Nevonlina theory. And Nevon Lina was the name of a, a very famous uh, Finnish mathematician, which is nowadays the name of a prize dis uh, distributed each four years in the International Congress of Mathematicians. So the Rolf Nevon Lina Prize is given to outstanding contributions in what, what they call mathematical aspects of information sciences. So it's a proof for computer scientists. It's a prize for computer scientists. Uh, so some elements uh, created by this uh, guy who died in 1980 are used nowadays in implementing and trying to find um, clever ways of solving and improving things about uh, derivability or underivability of such kind of identities. Now, here is a bonus. What about axiomatizing this thing? So if in school they haven't told us everything they needed to tell us about addition, multiplication, and exponentiation, we might ask ourselves now, what did we miss? Why didn't they tell us all the identities? Because it's impossible. So this guy, Gudevich, 1990, showed that actually you can't do this with a finite number of identities. So here before we had how many? 11 identities. You might be wondering whether there is a 12th missing or a 13th and so on. This guy proved using real mathematics, not using the computers, yet, that it's impossible to axiomatize this theory. So our teachers in high school didn't tell us everything because they couldn't. It's not because they're bad people. In some, some cases they are, but not because of that. Now, uh, there's a bonus here for, for the end. If anyone is interested in type isomorphisms, I might uh, mention a lambda calculus. I might mention a connection of this to lambda calculus. Let me go through to another example, which is very simple also, involves Boolean algebras, and was an interesting puzzle that rested for a long time, raised by this guy called Harold Robbins. And now I'm not going to, to talk about exhaustive checking, and I'm not going to talk about uh, model generation, but I'm going to talk about generation of proofs. Can the computer generate a proof given some element to work on? Now, everybody knows what a Boolean algebra is. If you don't, you probably have some suspicion about it. It's the algebra behind uh, classical propositional logic. And you might think of it as a complemented distributed, distributive uh, lattice. But even, if, even though you might have seen it several times before, my question is, can you recognize one when you see it? If I present it in a different way, can you tell me whether this is also a Boolean algebra or not? Now, in, in the 30s, there was a guy that uh, tried to reduce the number of axioms, which are a lot of axioms. All the axioms of distributive lattices plus complementation, a lot of things, a lot of identities. 
to a single axiom. And he was able to do it in what's called nowadays the Huntington identity, showing that everything that's true about Boolean algebras can be uh, extracted from this single axiom, which says something about, you might think of negation and the join or the disjunction, if you prefer. Of course, there is something missing here, but you might define it. You, I'm assuming here that the beat or the conjunction is definable using the Morgan rules. So it might be introduced later on. So this guy showed that this single axiom can derive all the other things you know about Boolean algebra. For instance, you know that conjunction is commutative, associative. This can be derived by the definition of conjunction plus the single axiom. And it's very parsimonial. There are very little, a few symbols involved. Let's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight symbols. Eight operations involved. Now, Robbins, shortly after this paper was published, proposed a new equation, which was even simpler. It has only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, instead of eight symbols. But he wasn't able to prove that this was also given all the axioms of, or all the identities characteristic of a Boolean algebra. So here the problem was solved. You change it just a little bit, and then nobody knew the answer any longer. He never published this. He just started telling this to his friends. Everybody went to visit him. He was telling this problem and giving them to them. And it became a favorite problem of Tarski, the same guy that I mentioned before. Tarski would give this problem to everyone that would visit him in Berkeley at some moment and say, why don't you solve this? It's a puzzle. Try to, to, to show that it's true. Now, let me write down what, what he had. So again, he just uh, had the uh, supposition that join is a commutative and associative and had this uh, single axiom on top of this. Okay? Now, this was uh, quickly, uh, quickly became a benchmark for theorem provers. If you have a good prover, it should be able to prove from this axiom all the axioms of Boolean algebras. So even nowadays, it's too used to check whether you have a good prover, good computer prover in your hands. But first, we had human provers. And these human provers had a lot of problems. So some of the things they, they, they started discovering a lot of years after the problem was posed in the 90s was that if any of these five identities here is true, then Robin's algebras are Boolean. So this was a good thing. Now we have the problem of checking whether this one of these five identities is true. And they're much smaller, they're much simpler. For instance, the, 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 this, uh, this one says that you must be able to find two elements such that their join is the first element. Can we or can we not find these two things? Now there is something interesting about some of these identities. Some of, uh, most of them are like usual identities. They, they involve an arbitrary acts, arbitrary symbols and some of them involve existentials. These existential ones are actually very important for the proof because the idea of the proof that would come later on was to suppose that this is false. So suppose that for every x and y this is not equal to that and deriving a contradiction from this. That was the way that eventually people were able to prove this uh, a few years later. So the idea used by this guy, William McCune, in 1997 at the Argonne National Laboratory in, near Chicago in the US was precisely to try to feed to the computer everything we know and try to make it, make it, make it produce a contradiction from the negation of one of these two conditions. And he was able to do it and there was a lot of press involved at the time and uh, eventually the computers needed eight days at the time and used 30 megabytes of memory, a lot of memory. Um, and he also mentioned about the, the size of the proof and so on. The proof was illegible. Nobody could understand it when they read. There was just too many parentheses going on, too long expressions going on. But what's interesting is that he produced, he invented uh, um, a, a prover, um, a computer prover called EQ, EQP to do the proof and it survives it's still inside some of the provers which still exist nowadays like um, Otter. Actually this should be, um, it should be Mace which is the, the 
the one that survived from EQP. EQP is not used any longer, but Mace and Otter are still used as provers, and they were born from these first uh, um, ideas of McCune. Now, computers are, 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 or can be used in this proof in several different ways. They were used by McCune in finding the proof. So the proof was found just by leaving the computer looking for it for eight days. And, it, and said, here's the proof. It was the first interesting proof that was open for many years in which the computers had played an interesting role in finding the proof. Of course, the humans advised the computer into don't look in that direction. But given that advice, the computer searched the proof and searched and searched and searched and found the proof by itself. Now, as I said, the proof is illegible. And then the computers were used also to parse the proof to be able to see the structure behind it, to be able to see the trees behind all those parentheses. Making the proof more, uh, more uh, streamlined, refining the proof was also the computers were used in doing this. And finally, in checking whether it's correct. So different ways in which the computers might be used in this, but it's fully computerized uh, a situation in which computer, computers were uh, very important in finding something which is just a puzzle, but a difficult puzzle that many people failed on for many years. Now, let me mention something which is much more than a puzzle. So-called capital conjecture. And here I'm going to talk about how formal verification hit the press. But what we now call capital conjecture was born many years before. It was born in... Where, when was it born? Well, I think it was in... 19th century also? Anyway, the uh, statement is quite simple. And apparently everybody in the market knows how it goes. The idea is that there is no way of packing spheres in such a way as to occupy less space as this way of packing them and putting things in a pyramid and putting things on top of each other, but not, not on top, but in the middle. Right? If you think of it in a two-dimensional analog, it would be something like this. You have circles and you put the other circle here. Okay? So there was a conjecture done by Kepler that uh, this was the best way of packing spheres. What's interesting about this problem is that it appeared in a letter let me tell you just a little bit of the story. It appears simultaneously, more or less, in England and uh, in Germany. Um, there was first uh, this guy called Sir Walter Raleigh, which had uh, an assistant. Which of finding a way of, of piling cannonballs, not oranges, but cannonballs. And said, what's, what's the best way of doing it? What's the way that occupies less space? And the guy uh, uh, mentioned uh, this problem later on, and Kepler knew about it and wrote uh, to, um, to his patron, the, the guy who was, give, was paying his wage, gave, uh, uh, wrote the problem down in this um, uh, nice uh, letter that he wrote to him in, I said, 19th century, 17th century. Now, this was open for a long time. And for instance, in 1831, the solution for the case in which you had this ever-expanding universe, but organized in a regular way, in regular lattices, the solution was found by Gauss, and he proved that not in the general case, but in the case where you have this very well organized, the solution was correct. Kepler was right about his conjecture. But still, this was not the full solution to the problem. There is this guy called uh, the A little bit well known in computer science uh, in rewrite uh, theory, uh, rewriting systems, um, and in decision uh, procedures. But at the time, much before the computers, he proved that for this example, the two dimensional analog, this solution was the best. It was the one that would occupy most of the, of the, the surface of the, of the plane. Now, this was such an important open problem that Hubert, David Hubert, in the beginning of the 19th uh, of, uh, of 20th century, he wrote down 23 important problems for the century, and he, this was one of the, these uh, 23 problems. And in 1953, this was still open, and there was this Hungarian mathematician who said, I have a solution, but I need a computer. And he didn't have one. 
So his method of solution actually was the one uh, University of Berkeley. He tried to give uh, a, a geometrical proof, not using the ideas of uh, Feyerstut, but uh, using uh, analytic proof. And he failed. Actually, he published two papers and people found problems in both papers, so apparently he didn't manage to find the proof. No one so far has uh, been able to uh, fix these problems in his proofs. Now, uh, Thomas Hales, um, at the end of uh, the, the, this uh, early millennium, he was at the University of Michigan and he announced that he had the proof of uh, this using the ideas of Hubert, uh, of Feyerstadt. Um, and this proof was so important, at least in his career, that he got a position at the University of Pittsburgh just because of it. Now, um, this guy Samuel Ferguson was his PhD student at the time, and he also ha helped in his works. So the proof that they found was uh, published in, 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 the, in the Annals of Mathematics first, but not in its full entirety. What happened? Well, first, this important mathematical, uh, mathematics paper uh, journal said that they would start accepting proofs partly done by the computer or, ex or completely done by the computer. And then Hales sent them in 1998. Here is my proof. It used the computer. So publish it. And they said, OK, we need to check. OK, it's just 300 pages of mathematical argument plus 40k lines of computer code and generates 3 gigabytes of data. They said, okay, so we will build a panel of 12 of the biggest experts in the world, mathematicians. They're going to uh, meet in Princeton. They're going to try to find out whether your proof is correct. And this panel was led by the son of the previous tote that I mentioned in the previous slide. Now what's interesting is that after these guys were for a lot of time thinking about this and trying to just to find out whether this paper was correct, they quit. They said, well, we're actually just 99% uh, certain that it's correct. This is really bad news for mathematicians. 99% is like zero. It's, we don't know if it's correct, right? We're not fully certain, so we're not certain at all. Now, because of this, the Annals of Mathematics decided not, no longer to accept computer proofs. Because they said, we're not able, we don't have people enough to check them. We don't have a way of producing an independent, independent uh, check of this proof. Okay, so um, they published only a 100-page paper, which was the kernel of, of the kernel of the paper. And the computational part they published elsewhere uh, in a journal called Discrete and Computational Geometry. And uh, there is an, a very interesting co comment by Ian Stewart on, on, the, on the proof. He's a, a writer about, uh, who writes about popular, mathematics, uh, popular books about mathematics. He says that Weil's proof of Fermat last theorem resembles war and peace. But Hale's proof of Kepler resembles a telephone directory. It's really horrible. It's not one thing that we would like to sit down and read. Okay, so uh, Hale's got a position, but he was insulted. He said, my proof is correct. I'm going to show them that it's correct. So he puts himself uh, the following challenge. I'm going to produce a fully verified math code of the proof. And then there will be no paper written by hand by a mathematician to check. This would be fully checked in the computer. Now, in 2006, when they wrote that paper, uh, uh, they won uh, the, the computational part of the paper. They won a prize, which is a very important prize in computer science. So uh, Hales won, won two prizes for the same thing. So first, for the uh, mathematical part, he wins the Robbins Prize. So it's the Robbins that I mentioned before. It's, uh, it's a prize that's given to um, papers that report on novel research in algebra, combinatorics, or discrete mathematics and shall have a significant experimental component. It's a small prize, but it's a, spice, it's a prize given to discrete mathematics. And the focus on prize that they won for the computational part uh, is given for outstanding papers in the area of discrete mathematics, and it's sponsored by the American Mathematical Society and the Mathematical Programming Society, and it's given each three years. It was won before by very important people. For instance, CARP, 
the guy that managed to, uh, to analyze NP-complete problems. And Appel and Haken, the guys that produced the, the proof of, the first computerized proof of the four color theorem. Now, let me just mention what they did. This FlySpec project. It's called FlySpec because it has F, P, and K. And they used the computer to find the first word in the dictionary that had F, P, and K. So FlySpec. Um, it's where you hold the flies, when you want to capture flies. So they started the project in 2003. They estimate that they need a lot of people and a lot of work years to finish the project of fully writing the, 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 this as in the computer as a fully formal uh, mathematical proof. But they finished much before. They finished only 11 years later. And it was in August of 2014 that I received this email in which he said that he was pleased to announce the comple completion of the project. It took only 5,000 hours of computer computation time at the time and um, it relies on these, these number of uh, pages of text, but it's all formalized inside the computer. And this was his biggest uh, victory, victory of the, at the time. It's interesting to mention three essential uses of computation in this proof. The first one is that they use an enumeration of a combinatorial class of structures that's now called uh, tame hypermaps and they use uh, the proof assistant Isabel in doing this uh, enumeration so computers are already used here in this in building this database around uh, the proof and using another computer assistant called whole light high order logic light uh, they implemented linear programming methods for establishing bounds for these for the equations uh, needed to in the proof and they used interval methods to verify all these inequalities, the thousand inequalities in the proof. Nobody would like to do this by hand. So they just used computer assistance also in these uh, three things. The rest is just things that we could do by hand. But these three things are actually some things in which computers might be extremely useful for. Okay, I finished this uh, talk by just mentioning buggy proofs. And I use here a, a picture of um, a big hero of logicians, Kurt Gödel, and I take the chance to uh, blame him for doing something that might be almost a mistake or a mistake in the proof. Let me let me try to explain why do I say it's it's almost a mistake. Well, buggy proofs. We have buggy programs. We might talk about buggy proofs. Um, there is an interesting uh, phrase by Donald Knuth. Uh, which most of you pr probably have heard about, uh, the creator of tech. He said, he has a piece of code in one of his books and he says that uh, after the code, beware of bugs in the previous code. I have only proved it correct, I have not tried it. Okay, so sometimes we have proofs in mathematics also that are things that people don't actually try. They say it's correct and so on. There might be a bug, let's see. Oh, there was a bug flying there. Uh, let me first define uh, uh, technically what's a screw up. <laughs> so this is a definition by Mark Dominus, who is a computer scientist in his blog. He uh, defines a screw up as a proof or something that was claimed to be a proof of a false statement that remains undetected for a long period, but actually is used by all the people as if it were correct. Now, this is different from what happened, for instance, with the four, four color theorem at the end of the 19th century, in which the proof was wrong. Here I'm talking about something that's not true. Four color, four color, theorem, four color theorem was true, the proof was wrong. Here I'm talking about something that's false, but that people take to be true. This is really serious. Now, let me just uh, um, then try to make this comparison between buggy software and buggy theorems and mention the statement by Giddle. The statement uh, is based on sentences in the following format. It will look mystical for, for many of you, and it looks mystical also for me. But just consider what happens if you have an expression which has any number of existentials, which might be empty, zero or more existentials, followed by one or more universals, followed by zero or more existentials. So it has this form, a lot of existentials, a lot of universals, but at least one, and a lot of existentials. Now, any sentence in this format 
can be used to talk about all the other sentences that I talked about in this talk. So it is very general. What Gedo uh, considered is the following. Uh, when is it that the theory, mathematical theory containing sentences in this format is decidable? And the claim is that it's decidable if and only if this n is 0, 1, or 2. Now this is very mystical. It's not very obvious why this should be true. But he proved this in this paper in 1933, among other things. And this uh, already allows us to talk about a lot of theories which have statements in this format. Okay? Now, there is one small assertion at the end of Kurt Gödel's paper. Uh, Gödel was a guy that used to think in Gothic, so that's why I write in Gothic here. Um, but at the end of his, this paper on the decision problem, he says, well, at the end, I would like to uh, make an observation that the proposition one uh, is also true for formulas that involve equality. And the proof goes pretty much the same way as the proof that I did here before. He just writes this down. He doesn't write a proof, okay? So that's why I said it's not a real mistake. But I, I, it's my only chance of saying something uh, nasty about Gedo. It's so brilliant. But he writes this thing saying that, well, you can generalize my proof for expressions involving equality. Little problem. First of all, he was wrong in saying that his proof was extensible for the language containing equality. To use and to extend the proof for this language, you have to change his proof. His proof doesn't work for this language containing equality. But much worse than this, it doesn't hold at all, it's false. So for the language involving equality, his assertion is false. And only 1983 that people found out about this, 50 years later, and in between these two facts, a lot of people believed that this was true and implemented uh, decision procedures for this fragment that is not decidable. So they believed in something wrong. Now the grand challenge that I leave for all of you here at the end is whether can any of you make better? Maybe using a computer assistant. Can any of us guarantee that in the future we will not do major screw-ups and produce buggy proofs? And how can we guarantee this? Thank you very much.